Let's talk sports at 321-309-9590 or toll free at 772-664-9590. Now more of the Mark Moses Show. Hey, welcome back to the show here on a Thursday. So to come, John Torres, Florida Today newspaper. We'll talk about all his recent articles and recap game two of the World Series last night as the Royals... They got even with the Giants. Game three set for Friday night there in San Francisco. But on the Club 52 hotline right now to talk Florida Gator football, good friend of ours from Gainesville. His name is Jeff Barless with ESPN.com. Jeff, how you doing today, man? I'm good, Mark. How are you? Hey, I'm doing just fine. And look, we, we got word yesterday, I know you're reporting on this, how Muschamp on the SEC teleconference said, hey, I'm going to go with Treon Harris as my starter against Georgia. Was there a fist pump by Florida reporters? <laughs> <laughs> what happened exactly? Well, maybe only in the sense that it was a very obvious move. Uh, you know, maybe they, they because Treon was suspended the week before the Missouri game, it, it wasn't possible to make this move sooner. But, uh, you know, you just look at the, the raw numbers of what's happened with this offense in Driscoll's hands, and I don't think there was anything else he could do. Uh, you know, I think you risk – you've already lost most of the fans, maybe all the fans, and uh, I think there's a risk that you completely lose the locker room if you don't make this change. Now, Driscoll is still going to have a role uh, in this offense, but – it makes a whole lot more sense when you look at his strengths and weaknesses to have him playing that sort of uh, Tebow role from 2006, or 2006 yeah. as a freshman when he kind of came in and was a short yardage back, uh, you know, could throw the ball a little bit. I, that's, that sounds like a good role for Jeff Driscoll. Yeah, I would just make him the starting running back because and I know I know I know I'm sarcastic when I say that, but you look at the running backs for this team, and I know we got problems with the quarterback, but Matt Jones, Kelvin Taylor, I feel like they haven't given anything to this offense last two weeks. I just make Driscoll the running back behind uh, Treon Harris. Is, is it crazy to say that? Well, I've also heard uh, some folks say that he should be the tight end <laughs> in Florida. Florida he doesn't have a lot there either. Uh, but you know the the running back position is, I think, one of the more area, one of the more talent rich areas on the team. It's just been uh, you know a, a comedy of errors that's kind of prevented this offense from doing anything positive. And with that, you you've kind of seen the last uh, the last stand and and the last hope for anything to to really work. Even the running game isn't working with some of these backs and. And the offensive line playing better than than last season, but still, uh, you know, just a dysfunctional offense at this point. And I'm not sure Tre- Treon Harris, who is a 19 year old, by the way, I'm not sure that he's really the answer. I don't know if there is an answer for this offense. Well, you saw late in the Missouri game. I know it's really bad, uh, but you look at that fourth quarter. Harris was moving the ball, making some plays. I mean, wasn't that kind of the decision by Muschamp? Like, okay. Let's just see what Harris can do moving forward. I mean, was that really the key? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, they've they've constantly referred to Treon Harris as, uh, you know, a guy with confidence who gives his teammates a spark and, most importantly, has a knack for making plays. They've seen it over and over in practice. They've seen it in the limited amount of time that he's been on the field in games. And I think they're they're hoping that if he brings that to the uh, – to the Georgia game that the good will outweigh the bad. Certainly, it, you know, it was garbage time against Missouri and, and the Tigers were just kind of watching the clock burn away. But you can't there, – there's no arguing that Harris has the ability to make plays with his feet and his arms and, and extend plays. That's something that Driscoll's really struggled with. Going back to the Missouri game, I, I got to get your thoughts because I know you were in the building – when they're giving up turnover. Yeah, giving up turnover after turnover. Look, I, I also watch party here in Brevard County, Florida, right? They were not happy, right? <laughs> and we're, we are hundreds of miles away. What was it like in the swamp, especially in that second half? What was the feeling in the building? Well, it's a good thing that there weren't any pitchforks and torches because, <laughs> uh, you know, it, you saw fans heading for the exits at halftime. 
and not coming back. And, and really in the third quarter, uh, you know, it got bad. There were boos for the quarterback. That's never a good look. Uh, and, and then you've got the fire must champ chance that those came after Florida had, uh, you know, a pick six and a, a fumble for an interception. I mean, there was a, uh, I, I, someone has said that Missouri ran like five plays in the entire third quarter and yet scored, you know, those points. Uh, it was, it was really, uh, it had gone from kind of comedy to tragedy and, uh, you know, it, you hear this fan base, and and to hear that anger sort of boil over to the point where they're chanting for the coach to to lose his job. I mean, things are pretty serious here, and and it's uh, these are some pretty dark days for the Florida football program. Was there a sense Sunday and Monday morning that like, okay, Muschamp could be fired maybe by yeah. Monday or Tuesday? I mean, was it really like that? Absolutely, I. I I could almost promise you that any of my uh, my fellow reporting associates, uh, any reporter is going to do what I did, which is prepare a story and, and mm-hmm. work their sources, because uh, it was very possible that it could happen on Sunday, on Monday, on Tuesday. Uh, what is today? Thursday? It could yeah. still happen. So, um, you know, we're all sort of on alert for for that story to break. But at the same time, you know, Foley issued another statement on Monday. It wasn't his strongest one. He didn't even name Muschamp specifically. And uh, and he sort of changed his his wording from saying that we're going to give this uh, coach the entire season before we evaluate him. And now he said we're going to continue to evaluate as the season plays out. And, uh, you know, you could certainly say that, that Muschamp has to beat Georgia I think that you know winning that game could perhaps win him back a little bit of life, maybe win back some fans. But beyond that, if Florida loses that game, the only thing left is uh, you know beating Vanderbilt and Eastern Kentucky and South Carolina and becoming bowl eligible. Uh, you know, I could see this playing out the entire season and Florida making a decision after it's done. Uh, but I do think the wheels are probably in motion already just to cover, just in case. We're here with Jeff Barless, ESPN.com, covers the SEC and especially the Florida Gators. Does a great job. Always appreciate him coming on. Isn't that weird, though? We live in a world now that I hope we can get to a bowl game. I, I never, <laughs> I, you know, I never thought in a million years when I when I started covering the SEC and especially the Gators like you, I never thought I'd ever say those words on this show. But isn't that the norm now for the Florida Gators? Well, right now, I think that you know, in the in the grand scheme of history, you know that you can look at the Muschamp years similarly, uh, similar to the Zook years, where there was a dip in the program. I think that all the you know resources in the world are still in place here. I think that Florida will look to make a slam dunk hire, uh, you know, after this uh, situation plays itself out, and and you know, this could just be a dip, just like the Zook years were. Uh, I, I have a hard time imagining that the Florida program is going to be down for the long haul or even take a serious hit to its image the way that Tennessee did with so many years of kind of, uh, you know, wandering around the, that wilderness of irrelevance. I don't, I don't see that happening with Florida, but uh, certainly the next hire is absolutely crucial because if they – miss on that that's where things snowball and you've got some major problems down the road well i'm looking at the craigslist ad right now where it goes over (laughs) what what we need the first thing i agree with is have you applied for it i i can i can lose to um uh, let's see georgia florida state i can do that so can i get the job is that cool (laughs) <laughs> well, I mean, if you don't mind the pitchforks and the torches, oh. uh, you know, that's, that could be down the road. I think these fans, you know, expect to get back to that level where, where you know, it, lose it. You, you don't go into a season expecting to lose to the Alabamas and Florida States and Georgias, uh, you know, certainly Georgia. I mean, this, this next game is a, is a clear referendum on, on what's happening with the program. Uh, you know, I, I'm writing a story next week on – just how just how the series has gone back and forth. I was in the locker room in Georgia's locker room back in '93, uh-huh. and it was the first time in 30 years that an entire four-year 
uh, class of football players had not beaten Florida. Huh. And similarly, if Florida loses next weekend, it will be the first time in nearly 30 years that Florida went four years without beating Georgia. So it's, it's a remarkable series. Uh, you know, there's incredible dynamics with Muschamp being a, uh, a, a Georgia Bulldog player and, and now growing up in Gainesville and coaching the Gators and, and sort of, you could call this his last stand if you want, but, uh, you know, that game is just going to be incredible uh, buildup. I don't know if it's going to be pretty to watch, though. Wait a minute, wait a minute. You're covering 93. What Were you eight years old at the time? Well, I'm confused here. <laughs> <laughs> I only sound young. I only sound young. <laughs> Great. Okay. Can we agree? Like, look, if you have to look for a new coach, right? Muschamp's still the guy, right? We, and, you know, it's one of those things where it's like, you want the Gators to win. Like, I want Muschamp to succeed. But let's say we have to go in another direction. Don't you need a guy like a Brian Kelly or, or kind of the Urban Meyer mold, a guy who's coached at different le- levels as a head coach, a guy who can recruit? Don't you need something like that than not just the next hotshot coordinator for the next coach of the Gators? Absolutely. I, I think that everyone right now is looking around at who that is. Uh, coaches who's had success, preferably offensive success, uh, at a school where maybe they're in a conference or maybe they're in a in a geographical location where it's pretty obvious that if Florida did come calling, even a successful coach would very you know would very likely jump at the offer. You know, you think of guys who uh, you know may have already reached the ceiling at, at wherever they're located, but. You know, Chip Kelly, uh, Steve Spurrier, some of these things sound a bit like fantasies. No, yeah. And, uh, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to look into all of these possibilities, but I, I'm going to be surprised if uh, an NFL coach of one of the top teams in, the, in that sport is, is really thinking, you know, that he's having so much trouble with the program that he wants to come back to college. You know what's interesting is you said it. We need offense because that's what I always think. You know, look, I grew up in the Midwest, but everything I know about the Florida Gators and the history is they're going to go score points on you. And it's not, I hope we can. No, we're going to go do it. Is that really the key? Like, hey, we're the Gators. We need to put some points on the board. Isn't that really the key, getting back to that? I think it's, it's, I, I think you nailed the, you know, the perception of the school. All of Florida's success is based on Spurrier and Meyer. And those were offensive coaches with offensive juggernauts. And, uh, you know, Florida has struggled on offense since 2009. Uh-huh. That is such a long period of time that you're talking about high school kids who aren't even aware of Percy Harvin. Uh, you know, it's, it's a real problem when, you know, these teenagers are making their decisions based on image and they don't know anything other than Florida's malfunctioning offense so that has to change and it has to change with good coaching and uh you know it's it's something that would be a stark contrast to what we've seen here in the last four seasons see see here's the thing i'm in with this and we're here at jeff barla cspn.com i appreciate coming on i always love getting you on um i really think you know you got to be careful here where florida state and jimbo fisher they're getting all the big recruits in the state of Florida. You can't sit around and keep losing to Georgia, Florida State. So this losing is contagious. That's what I'm scared about because Florida State's the champion and they're getting all the recruits. They don't care what's written in the New York Times. Those recruits are still going there to Tallahassee. Wouldn't you agree with that? Where you got to make sure you get recruiting back to go to, go to Gainesville? I do agree in principle. I, I just think that Florida's uh, resources, Florida's uh, financials, Florida's uh, geographical location being in the most fertile recruiting state in the in the in the country. I, I think those things aren't going away. And I would point to, I mean, certainly it's a big hit when you see, you know, your arch rival just uh, a couple hours to the west. You see them at the pinnacle of of the sport right now. Whether whether it's going to stay that way or not. But, uh, you know, if you want an understanding of just how cyclical these things are and just how hard it is to keep one of these big Florida programs down, and I mean Florida, Florida State, and Miami, you know, just look at when Florida was winning those those two national titles in three seasons, 2006, 2008. Look at what FSU was doing. They were absolutely struggling 
they were they were making the same complaints that all the the best recruits were going to Florida. Mm-hmm. I mean, for goodness sake, the Pouncey twins grew up FSU fans, and they <laughs> came to Florida and kind of extended that run. So, um, you know, this I don't think this is a life sentence. But, uh, you know, as I said before, I think it's critical that Florida makes the right hire uh, to turn this around because the the offense has to, you know, there's too much talent either on the roster or or in high school waiting to to give this a shot to, uh, to continue to fail at this level. Great stuff. And I just want you to know, Jeff, you do a fantastic job over these past, I'd say, couple weeks doing like court law and order headlines. I know that's not your MO, <laughs> but it's been nonstop with you, man. You do a great job. Well, thanks, Mark. It's always a pleasure getting on here and talking with you. Great stuff. Jeff, I'll see you around, all right? All right, my friend.